Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. Now, you must remember that, let me, let me, let me share this testimony with you. There was a time in my life I had this boil on my face. It was big. And the boil was on my face for about three years or so. It was hard and it just didn't go. And people will ask me, wow, you got a boil on your face? I say, yes. He said, it looks hard. That is sure it's not a tumor. I said, excuse me? And it was becoming embarrassing because people said, but it's just there, it's not soft, it's not going, it's not reducing, it's not getting bigger. It's just there and it's hard. It was hard. If you touch it, it was hard. And I said, well, I, I think it's going to a time I, I need to get, even I'll be meeting somebody for the first time. They say, oh, what's on your face? Looks, is it a boil or something else? I said, well, it's getting embarrassing. I have to do something about it. And I said to the boil, you know, John 14, I think verse 23 says, whatsoever you demand in my name, I said, I will do it. I said, oh boy, residing under the skin in my face, I command you in the name of Jesus the Christ to leave my face and leave no mark behind. Now, um, I had two options to seek a medical procedure. They will cut it and remove it, which I was... I was thinking about so I, I said and people ask me oh you have a boil on your face now I had two options say no I reject it in Jesus name that's not what God did I didn't deny it so after I made that declaration when they say you have a boil on your face I said oh it's going soon you won't see very soon the next time you'll be shocked it would have gone I said oh really are you doing a surgery I said you don't bother about the procedure but the next time we meet it would have gone and that's what I said. Now, by that statement, I did not deny the existence of the boy. I did not reject the existence of the boy. I did not pretend the boy was not there. I just said what was going to happen the next time they saw me. About two days later, I woke up and I noticed my face opened where the boy was of its own. It just opened. And the boy came out. In fact, I couldn't go out because it was coming out. It was a big, like... Like a hard knot, almost like my hand. It came out of its own, but I kept it for about one year. I don't know, I misplaced it later on because maybe as a souvenir and I didn't really need that. And it came out of its own and it closed back according to what I said. Now, I didn't say, oh God, maybe it was that place I visited and I slept and I slept on their bed that has caused this boy low. I didn't blame anybody. I didn't deny the existence. I didn't complain. I didn't murmur. I just declared what I wanted and I got exactly what I said. Till date, if I never said it to anybody, there is no single mark on my face. There's a young man, he had a fire accident and he had severe third degree burns. Third degree burns. When I was called and I visited him at the general hospital, was at a pair then. I, 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 I'm, nothing really moves me when I saw him. I said, what is this? His skin had peeled off and the entire skin. I see have some of the pictures of the state I saw him. It's still in my um, gallery, my phone. It's scary. It's scary. It's a third degree burn. The entire skin is handsy. The generator fumes exploded on him and the fire, he caught fire himself. And while trying to extinguish himself, he fell from the balcony of his house on the floor and went subconscious. So his body was still on fire. So people came and helped extinguish it. So he was burning. They rushed him to the general hospital at Ekbe, that's government hospital, where I went to visit him. When I saw him, I said, what is it? The first thing I said, I mentioned his name. Now, I was told a third degree burn takes on an average three months to be sorted out. And when it's sorted out, the skin will remain peeled. I said to him, you'll be out of here in a month healed and your skin will be black back to the way it was. But I said, I will leave a small portion of your skin in your feet where your shoes can cover. 
to help you remember this day. No, human beings can easily forget. To help you remember this day that God Almighty saved you, healed you completely, and brought you out of the jaws of death. So I prophesied, that was the first thing I told him. I said, you're coming out of here alive. You're coming out of here healed. You're coming out of here in less than a month from now. You're coming out of here with all your skin back as black. Those, I just say, yeah, what happened? You two, you shouldn't have done this. Why were you feeling petrol when you were? That's what people say when they see somebody's crisis. Everybody say, you two, you shouldn't have done this. Didn't you see this? Ah, ah, were you blind? Why were you overspeeding? That's what I've been telling you. It's a wrong way to approach crisis. Very wrong. You can deal with that later. You can reprimand later. But the first thing that must come out of your mouth is what you want to see in that person's life. When I said it, um, he continued the medical procedure. Uh, we had to buy quite a lot of things. And they were treating him in the hospital. The 20, I visited him every week, like about once or twice a week. And the 22nd day, he called me. He said, I'm in my house. I said, you're doing what? Who asked you to leave? He said, I've been discharged. He said, when he was discharged, his boss sent an ambulance to come and pick him because it's a third degree burn. And they wanted to take him to another hospital where they believe he would get better, uh, you know, better care and better medical attention. He said the consultant that handled him said to him, in my 35 years of practice, I have never seen a third degree burn of this magnitude heal in such a time and the skin restore again. His skin went back as black. When the ambulance got to the hospital from his office, they couldn't find him there. They called him, they said, where you said I'm in the house? They said, doing what? They came to meet him, they found him healed. They were shocked that a third degree burn could have the skin back in 22 days. I'm talking of his hands, his back, his, his chest, and his two legs, the whole body. Remember I said his body was on fire. When he came back to church a few months later, he said, Pastor, I said, what? He said, all my skin is black and there is no proof that I ever had a fire incident except a small portion in my leg. He said, I want you to pray for the black skin to cover it. I said, okay. We prayed and prayed. It never covered and it remains till today. What you say in the first of that, in the face of that crisis, remains forever. Most of the time, you cannot change it again. And that's what God honors. And so I want to encourage you if you don't know what to say in the midst of the challenges, please keep quiet and don't say a word until you know what to say. Praise the Lord. Now, I want us to look at a few scriptures, a few examples, and I'll give you also a few testimonies. Um, in Genesis, Genesis 22, 1 to 5. Now, it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham said to him, Abraham, he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, cleared the wood for the burnt offering, rose up, went unto the place which the Lord God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes, saw the place afar off. Now in verse 5. Now God told him to do, um, offer Isaac as a bond offering, meaning Isaac was going to be killed and roasted overnight. And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the ass and I and the lad who is Isaac will go to the mountain and worship and we will return back to you. He declared the end of the matter. What will happen on that mountain, I don't know. Whether Isaac will die, I don't know. Whether Isaac will live, I don't know. Whether it will be burnt, I don't know. But one thing I know, and this is how this matter will end, myself and Isaac will return back to you here. That is how to handle crisis. 
in Mark chapter 4, verse 26, it says, The kingdom of God is like a grain of a mustard seed, which a man found and planted into the earth, and it begins to grow. How it grows, he does not know. First the air, then the stalk, then the blade, and then the fruit. And when the fruit is come, he puts in the sickle. That's Mark 4, 26. He puts in the sickle, and then he rips it. He says, how it grows, how God is going to solve it, you don't know, but what God demands from you, give him the word to use to handle that crisis. Tell him how you want the crisis to end. And I keep saying it, Nigeria is going to be great again. Nigeria will return to the league of the great nations of the earth in the name of Jesus. How it's going to happen, I don't know, but it will happen and it will happen in my time. I will leave this nation for my children and my children's children blessed, peaceful, prosperous. Not a nation haunted by terrorists. It's going to be a nation that was fruitful, that was prosperous in the mighty name of Jesus. And you must say that for your family. You must say that for your children. You must say that for your finances. You must say that for your career. Don't spend your time running people down. Don't spend your time blaming everybody. Leave that to God. He will sort them out. If he's a charlatan on the podium, his day is coming. And the judgment of God, the fire of God is coming. And it will sift the wheat from the shaft. It's coming soon. And we will know who is called. And we will know who was, who went and is not called. Leave it for God. Concentrate. You know, Peter told the Lord, he said, this John... How are we going to, you know what Jesus told? He said, leave John. If I would that charlatan, continue as a charlatan. If I would he continue, stealing money. He said, what is that with you? He said, you face your destiny. Face your purpose and fulfill that which I've called you to accomplish in life. So I will deal with the chaff at my own harvest time. And so I want to encourage you. Don't despair at this time we're in. Don't be discouraged. Don't even be fearful. Don't be fearful of any virus. Don't be fearful of any terrorists. Don't be fearful of anything. And that doesn't mean you should not tempt the Lord and say, I can do anything. I can touch anything. No, that's tempting God. You don't do that. You observe the rules given. You observe safety rules. You don't say God protects you. So you leave your doors open and go to sleep. He said, except the Lord watches. The watchman stays awake in vain. He's still going to use the watchman. He's still going to use the security agents. He will use the police and the military. But it is God using them to keep us safe. It's not just them staying alive by their weapons. It is God using those weapons to keep us safe and keep them alive. He said, otherwise, the watchman stays awake in vain. But nevertheless, don't despair don't lose hope. Don't lose courage. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 11, it says the race is not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor strength to the, nor, nor victory to the strong, or, or bread to the wise. He said, but time and chance is going to happen to every man. Your day is going to come in this life. A day will come when heaven will open the doors and the four gates of prosperity for you. Irrespective of what you're facing, irrespective of your academic qualification, irrespective of who you know, irrespective of what you have, that day will come. Heaven will give you that window. My prayer is that when that day comes, you will seize that opportunity and you will make it in life in Jesus' name. But if you are spending time running people down, when that day comes, that man will not see it. He would have been distracted. And so I want to encourage you, all is not lost yet and it's not as bad as people are making it look like. Do you desire to live and operate God's way of doing things? Do you desire to understand how faith works? Fundamentals of Faith is a book written by Kayode Adeshoga. It teaches in simple terms how to operate the God kind of faith that helps you overcome all hurdles of life. Fundamentals of Faith is available for purchase at Trem Bookshop Obani Koro Lagos and Bible Wonderland Stadium Suruleri Lagos. Get a copy today. I'll share one or two testimonies with you. There's a lady, she wanted to get into one of the private universities we have around. This is about five years ago, six years ago. 
and um, she didn't meet the cutoff point in her jam result, and she wanted to read economics. So she got economics in another university, which she didn't want, and her parents were trying to tell her, well, why don't you go to this place? She said, no, I want this particular place. And they approached me because both the mom and the daughter were members of the church. So I was approached and I was told, um, Pastor, please help us talk to her to take that other one. She doesn't meet the qualification. The mother took her to meet a professor in that university and she was offered, I'm trying to remember that course, um, the dermatography or something. I think it's dermatography or something. I can't remember. She said, that's not what I want. I want economics. So the mother was saying, you either take this dermatography or you take economics in another place. So they brought, they called me and said I should talk to her, that maybe being the pastor, I'll be able to convince her. And I said to the mom, I said, if it's only one person that will be taken for economics in that university, she is the one. That was the first thing that came out of my mouth. And mom said, wow. And she didn't know what to say. Being the pastor, you know, most people don't like arguing with pastors. And then she didn't know what to say. She was like, oh, okay. And they left it. So when they went to me, the professor said, you have better take this. And if you don't take it now, very soon we'll tell you there's no space because people are rushing it. She said she doesn't want. I said, okay. So she sat at home and one day she just got this text. Congratulations, you've been offered admission for economics in this particular university and uh, make a deposit. You know, you have to make a, um, a, I think a payment of an acceptance fee or so. So the mom thought it was the professor that did it. So when they went to meet the professor to tell him, oh, thank you for helping us get economics. The professor said, I told you to come and take them out. Is it dermatography? I can't remember. You didn't take it. It's too late. There's nothing I can do for you. Sorry. You should have taken it when you had the opportunity. There's nothing I can do to help you. Then it dawned on them. It wasn't him that did it. It was God. It was God. He honored that word. How he did it, nobody knows. He says, how the plant grows, we do not know. It's the prerogative of God. Don't worry yourself with how. If he needs your input, he will tell you. In the vision, he told Kenneth Hagin about his wife. Submit your wife for surgery and she will be healed. So he told them the procedure and they went through it. If there's any obvious procedure you need to do, then you go through it. If there's no obvious, then you leave it to the Lord. He will sort that out. But he expects you to declare how you want that situation to end. That's how she got admission into the university and read economics and graduated and she's doing wonderfully well. Amen. She's graduated and doing very well. I remember once we wanted to move from a location where we were, wanted to move to another location. So I told the church, next week Sunday is the last Sunday we're going to hold in this venue. They asked me where we're moving to. I said, I don't know. So what are we going to do? I said, I'll communicate with you where the venue is. But God said to me, we're done here and we need to move. People think it's crazy. That's what Abraham did when he sojourned to a land that he didn't know. I'm not saying you should do it, but sometimes we may find ourselves in some quagmire situations and we have to take some very tough decisions. I had to take that decision at that time. We needed to move not knowing where we're going. So I said, we would communicate with you next week Sunday. And I said, where we're gonna use. I said, next week Sunday, we're gonna be in a hall it will be air conditioned. It will be bigger than where we're using. We have, then we didn't have space for children's church. We're going to have the space for children's church. Then we didn't have space for parking. We'll have space for parking. People said, wow, pastor, for what you described, where's the place? I said, I don't know. I said, how come you're saying where we will be and you don't know where it will be? You're mentioning the facilities that will be there and you don't know. I said, I don't know. But I know what we're going to have, where we're going. They said, wow. Somebody said, why did you take this risk when December, when most of the halls are occupied? I said, God doesn't need when the halls are occupied or when they are free. God doesn't need all that. He can get it done, whether in December, January. And remember, His grace is made perfect in weakness. In January, February, when most of the halls are not being used, that grace is not made perfect for us anymore. Now they're all occupied. It's made perfect. And so, 
we close, we removed our things. On Tuesday, I said, a member of the church said, Pastor, why don't we look around? Whether we looked around, we didn't see. On Thursday, another person said, let's look around, let's look around. We looked around, I'm just driving. Someone said, wow, I've never seen this place before. Can we go inside and have a look? We went inside, and then we met the manager and said, do you have a hall here? They said, yes, we do. So we came to look at it. They said, what do you want to use the hall for? They said, for church. We said, for church. They said, oh. They said, sorry, there's an embargo for the past two years that this place will not be used for church, but I think there is a memo that just came and said, from this week, we can use it for religious purposes. But just hold on, let me confirm. She went and confirmed. They said, yes, the memo came on Tuesday of that week that the hall cannot be, can now be used for religious purposes. I said, does he have air conditioner? They said, yes. Does he have a space for children's church? They said, yes. I looked at the compound. It can pack all the cars. They said, I said, okay, we'll take it. They said, from when do you want? I said, from this Sunday. They were shocked. They said, this Sunday? I said, yes. They said, okay, go and make payments. I didn't have any money to make payments. Um, that, that day, I said, okay, I'll make payments in about um, before the close of the day. They said, yes. So that day, someone sent some money to me. I said, you know what, Pastor? Let me keep this money. I don't want to spend it. It's a family member. I said, I don't want to spend this money at all. If I keep it with me, I will spend it. So just keep it with you till whenever I need it. I said, thank you. I just took out of that money, paid for the haul. And on Sunday, I communicated with everybody. They came around and they said, wow. It's bigger than what we use. They said, yes. Is that space for children's church? Yes. Is that space for parking? Yes. What happened? I got what I said. I got exactly what I said. Most of the time you've been getting what you've been saying. It's time to change what you have been saying, not from what you are seeing, not from what you are experiencing, but from what you want it to be. Amen. Some five years back, we were staying in an apartment. It was very small. If I had to be sleeping in the sitting room, it was so small, and we needed to move. It was very small. I didn't even have the money to move. So I said, this Christmas, we will no longer be here. We would have moved, and I said exactly what I wanted. To an apartment that's going to have this, it's going to have this, it's going to have this, it's going to have this, which will help me get my work done better. And I said, this Christmas, I guess it was about, um, this, uh, this is 2020, maybe like 2015 or so. I said, by December this 2015, I won't be in this house. I'll be in my new house where, and then it was about October, which we have this, 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 this. December came, I didn't move. And my friends would call me, said, oh, I want to come and see you. Um, have you moved? Because I told everybody I was going to move. I said, um, yet to. They said, oh, so you are still at the old place? I said, yes, for now. So they will come. It looked embarrassing. But the Bible says you must maintain your confession. And in the face of apparent failure, don't retract your confession. And they will come and I say, this coming Easter, we won't be here. We'll be at the new place. It will be this, 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 this. And Easter came. And we'll still be there. And someone will call me, oh, Pastor Ken, I want to come and see you. Please give me your new address. I said, oh, um, for now, I'm still at the order. I said, oh, so you haven't moved? I said, no. And they will come. I said, don't worry. By um, summer, would have moved. I remember once an elderly person came to my house, was going to Cardinal. I said, you're going for about three months. Please, when you're coming back, you need to let me know. Because if you come here, you'll meet us here. And three months later, when she was coming, so, oh, Pastor, boy, where's the new place? I said, for now, we're still at the old place. And it went on for two years. I did not change my confession, never. It looked embarrassing. I maintain the Bible says, holding fast to your confession. For faithful is the Lord, the high priest of our confession. is a high priest of our calling, the Lord Jesus, Hebrews 10, 36. I held on to it. I didn't change it. I held on to it. I didn't change it. After about two years, one December, was around October, just like before, I said, this December, 
we won't be here. We'll be at a new place in January, first week in January, we'll be at a new place. We'll be spending the new year at a new place. And it will be this, 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 this. And as usual, people call me in January. Oh, Pastor K, are you still at the old place? I said, no, I'm at the new place. So, oh, so you have moved now? I said, yes. It will happen one day. <laughs> it may look like it will not happen. It will happen one day. Don't change it. Don't change it. Don't stop saying it. In Joshua 1.8, he told Joshua, this book of the law will not depart out of your mouth. You meditate in it day and night. You observe to do all that is written there. And he said, then you make your way prosperous and then you have good success. He said, you say day and night. So the only time you can stop saying it when it's neither day and it's neither night. And so the times we're in are perilous times challenging times and Christ is rearing its head in all means. People have projects to do, they don't have money and they're wondering how they're going to get the money. I would declare the end of that project. People have things to accomplish, they don't have the means to do it. I would declare, it says to Zerubbabel, you have laid the foundation of this house. You shall complete it not with hard work, with the shout of grace. It shall be completed with its shout of grace. That's the book of Zechariah. It says, Zerubbabel will finish. He said, what thou, O great mountain, that will stand before Zerubbabel. He said, you shall become a plain. He said, but Zerubbabel will complete the house with the shout of grace. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information on how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again same time next week, I want to tell you don't give up. Faith works. It's working and it will work in your life. God bless you.